get started. Thank you so much um, for your patience. We wanted to wait for some very special guests um, who have um, um, flown in from very far away from halfway around the world. So we're, we're so grateful to have them and to have many other folks who've um, uh, come in. Um, a lot of Ali's um, um, family is here from all over. So we're um, super excited uh, to have you guys as guests and thank you all for coming as well as all the folks. No, I unmuted it. <laughs> um, thank you also for all the faculty um, who are here who have helped uh, Ali throughout these six years and, and to, um, many who are unable to come. There have been there are several faculty who have not been able to make it who have done an enormous amount to help Ali. I want to acknowledge um, um, those folks as well. Um, well, let me start off first for those of you who care. Um, <laughs> I wanted to say that Ali's thesis is uh, her chapters have been published in Ecology Letters, in Animal Behavior, uh, in um, a Science of the Total Environment, in Proc Roy Sock, and one is going to be um, submitted to Evolution any day now. So um, it's, I think, by any measures, uh, a phenomenal thesis. But But that's actually not why I'm I wanted to introduce her because you can see that on her CV, you can read her thesis, um, you know, uh, you can see that on Google Scholar. Um, Ellie is, um, she's so special to us. <laughs> I'm getting emotional. Um, she has, I really um, considered her, uh, she's really led our team in the field um, and, and, and work. Um, we're so proud of her. I think that, that's all I'm gonna say before I, <laughs> I totally lose it. Um, she has a phenomenal talk. Um, and, uh, and, and and one thing I want to say, this is not a doctor question mark. Um, everything has been signed off. Um, we're talking to Dr. Diamant. Um, um, we're excited for all of you guys to be here and, um, and hear this fantastic talk. Okay. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Um, thank you, Pam. That was very special. Um, and thank you for entrusting this system with me. So I'm going to be talking about multiple stressors within and across populations. Uh, and the question I've been fascinated with for the past six years is how predictable and repeatable is population response, evolution, and adaptation, and what mechanisms underlie that response? Um, Pam mentioned I have family here, which is very nice. Evan said I could bring them. Uh, I don't think that he realized that I have a very large family. Um, so I'm going to be doing a little bit of switching up my language throughout this talk. So another way of presenting this is what have I been up to for the past six years? Um, before getting into the research itself, I first just wanted to start off with some acknowledgments. Most of this work was completed on Tovangar, the unceded territory of the Gabrielino, uh, Gabrielino Tongva people. Sorry about the typo. Um, they are doing a land back campaign. So if you want to donate, I'm happy to share this link. Um, this was done across Southern California. So there are a few different um, uh, nations that have territory across this land, but most of the work was done here. I also want to acknowledge a ton of people that have made this possible. So science takes a community and this has uh, definitely demonstrated that. So first I wanna thank Pam, of course, for all of the guidance and support over the years. I wanna thank my committee members, Ian McGregor Forrest, who's in Helsinki and probably asleep. Um, Tom Smith, who is here, um, Morgan as well, thanks for coming. Um, and Priyanka Mara Sakari, who was on my committee up until uh, recently. So I wanted to acknowledge the mentorship that she provided me as well. Um, a lot of the work depended on uh, collaboration with other grad students in the Yale Lab, Natalie, Sam, Wilmer, Sarah, Felicia, Mars, and Carolyn, as well as undergraduate researchers who I've had the privilege of working with, over 30 students, some are here or on Zoom. Um, and I'm really grateful for their commitment to these projects. Um, I'm also grateful to a bunch of different small Audubon societies in the region, as well as um, different ornithological societies, the Wilderness Society um, and UCLA the Cret Center and EEB for funding this work over the years, as well as my community beyond UCLA, my family, thank um, <laughs> uh, friends, my dog, and all the Junkos who have contributed to this work. 
Um, I do want to acknowledge um, very directly all the research assistants that have made this possible. Uh, we've really built a strong community and field family over the years. Even during COVID, we met on Zoom. We hung out um, a lot. Field work is uh, very long, very early, a lot of waiting, and I'm really grateful for the, um, the community that we've built together. Okay, so with that, um, so I'm gonna be talking about anthropogenic stressors on, an, um, on ecosystems, so human-caused ecological change, basically. We are impacting our environment in multifaceted ways, from pollution to deforestation, desertification, um, invasive species and urbanization, uh, my favorite of them. Um, but a lot of these things are happening at once. So populations are facing multiple stressors and responding to them. So the focus of my work is understanding how populations respond to and adapt to multiple stressors at once. And this has basic to applied implications. So we can better understand population response, shifts and adaptation in real time, um, which allows us to answer some fundamental eco-evolutionary questions like how, um, how repeatable is evolutionary response, what mechanisms underlie that. Um, in an implied sense, we can see how, <clears throat> um, how multiple stressors interact, how organisms respond, which is essential to build predictions in a changing world um, and find potential solutions. So uh, Pam knows I like to overdo things. So I have quite a lengthy dissertation. So I'm breaking it up in these two different scales. First, I'm gonna think about this across species and the pattern of um, stressor response. So in the first chapter, I introduce a new framework from pharmacology and genetics to determine stressor interactions called the rescaled bliss independence. And then we apply that to three stressor interactions in populations. And then we're gonna delve into my favorite little bird, the dark-eyed junco, um, and understand phenotypic and behavioral adaptation. So first we're gonna look at morphology across cities in Southern California. And then we're gonna see how COVID and the pause of human activity affected fear response and nesting behavior to understand plasticity of these behaviors. And then I'm gonna talk about other stuff I've been involved with and different directions that the junco sphere is taking here, as well as um, forays into transdisciplinary engagement um, that I've had the privilege of taking part in. All right, so my first chapter is using a newly introduced framework to measure multiple stressor interactions. And this was done um, in collaboration with Aleph Tegan um, and a number of members in the Savage Lab, as well as the A Lab. We can categorize stressor interactions in a few different ways. So populations face multiple stressors. Um, to contextualize this, we can think about, let's say, coral facing acidification um, and hotter temperatures. Um, so we can think about how one stressor might affect that population's survival. So let's say temperature affects the survival um, and only 60% survive. Stressor B affects the survival and only 40% survive in isolation. Um, this additive null model, you would expect 24% survival. So this is our null expectation. A synergistic interaction is when two stressors, the two stressor effect is greater than the additive expectation. So we see more mortality than we would expect. Um, an antagonistic interaction is when um, the combined effect is less than that expectation. So synergy is something that's really important when we think about conservation and it's uh, been emphasized in the literature quite a lot. This is because the combined effect leads to even stronger um, negative effects than we would have expected. Um, and managing those are really important. <clears throat> but a lot of the methods that have been used to identify um, these interactions um, might have some flaws. Uh, so the assumptions are often limiting, not tested or sometimes violated because it takes a lot of uh, high sample size to really um, test those assumptions in these parametric tests. And a lot of these studies have low numbers of replicates because it's, it's laborious to do these kinds of full factorial experiments. Uh, the methods also have limitations to finding and identifying and classifying the magnitude of interactions, which I'll get into in a second. This section has a lot of math. Um, so I'm gonna try to simplify it verbally, uh, but if you drift off, just come back in a couple uh, minutes. <laughs> 
Okay, so uh, we use a method called the Bliss Independence Classification, which we adapt. I'll explain a little bit. So we look at that deviation from additivity, so how much that mortality might differ from um, the additive expectation using a relative fitness measure uh, relative to the control response. Um, and then what's really special about our method is that we rescale it. So this is kind of similar to rescaling fitness from the ultimate fitness um, to a population of relative fitness relative to the uh, best case scenario. So we rescale this um, interaction measure to um, full lethality when we have a more synergistic meaning interaction um, or to what's called buffering antagonism or suppression. Um, so buffering antagonism is a special case of antagonism where one interaction sorry, one stressor effect is masked by the presence of another stressor. And then suppression is when um, the population does better than expected um, based on those different um, stressor effects. So this method is really cool because we can rescale our um, interaction types. Uh, that's why we call this the rescale bliss independence or the RBI. And that allows for um, this multimodal distribution that allows us to identify these distinct interaction types. So this is the unscaled interaction measures, it's normally distributed. And in our study, these are the rescaled um, deviation from adaptivity, that rescaled bliss independence where negative one is um, the mode of a synergistic interaction, zero is additive, um, one is antagonistic, and two is that kind of special extreme antagonism we call suppression. So we did a meta-analysis and asked if our results were different from those originally reported interaction types, and if so, how? if we can identify any patterns in these interactions and if interactions vary by habitats or species types. So we looked at um, highly cited reviews that have been analyzed and reanalyzed um, in the literature, pulled data from a 25 year literature search using these key terms um, and looked at population level fitness response variables to population growth, survival and mortality. Um, and uh, pull data from full factorial experiments. So where you had a control, single stressor responses and two stressor responses. This led to um, us using 149 papers with 840 total interactions. So some papers had a lot of experiments, um, some had fewer. So we used all that fit our criteria. Uh, what did we find? Um, we found that our results were different from those originally reported. Um, and while initially, so, 70% of reported interactions were synergistic. We found that um, the majority of ours were additive or antagonistic. So it seems that synergy might have been overemphasized in the literature. Um, we identified some patterns. So synergies were more likely to be reclassified. Only 29% stayed synergies um, with our reanalysis. Um, and antagonism seems to be least reclassified. And this is kind of uh, we didn't have as many uh, terrestrial um, interaction types, but it seems that marine and freshwater systems have similar uh, patterns in interaction types, and there were fewer antagonisms in terrestrial systems. So in conclusion, it seems that antagonism is more prevalent than previously thought. Um, and this is important because we understand synergies as a conservation concern, um, and maybe we can better prioritize which stressors to address and avoid managing antagonisms as synergistic interactions, which can potentially lead to negative uh, consequences if we're um, removing something that might actually suppress um, a different stressor. So we applied this method to uh, three stressor combinations on population level fitness um, to understand higher order interactions and emergent properties, um, which I will explain in a second. Um, so this was in collaboration with different folks in the Yay Lab, uh, Shade Boyd, who's just finishing up a postdoc here, and Natalie was on a Huntelman um, and was recently published, which is cool. So as mentioned, populations face many stressors, not just two. Um, and the RBI is really cool because it allows us to parse apart these different kinds of interactions. We can think about three-way interactions as the combination of those two-way interactions we just talked about, as well as this emergent three-way interaction, which is what happens when you have all of them at once. Um, so we can separate those out with the RBI just to reorient ourselves. So let's say we have three different stressors. Um, the two stressors, we can have these kinds of interactions here that deviate from that additive expectation. 
Um, so this one is antagonistic. This one is synergistic. And then we can think about the three stressors present, how they deviate from the additive expectation. So this one is synergistic. The effect is larger than you expect. But we can also compare to those um, net three-way interactions to see if that's emergent or not. <clears throat> OK, so we went back through the literature um, and pulled more key terms, longer time period. And we asked a bunch of questions that will be uh, similar to the last chapter. So how well does this new framework match with previously published results? How often do emergent properties appear in higher order interactions? Um, and can we find patterns in those emergent properties? Do they occur in synergistic interactions or antagonistic interactions? Uh, we reanalyzed 142 papers, um, sorry, 38 papers, 142 combinations. Um, and we found that our, um, our methods seem to identify or re-identify um, a lot of interactions. So only six interactions of those 142 stayed the same. A lot of them changed in the net interaction type. Um, and then the difference between these two categories on the right. So a new idea is uh, for studies that said there was an interaction, didn't label them, um, or ones that didn't explore three-way interactions at all. <clears throat> we found similar to that two-way interaction um, paper that synergies were more likely to be re-identified as antagonism um, and additivities as well. Um, we had one reported antagonism that stayed the same. So uh, it seems that antagonism dominates net interactions. Um, here, suppression is that special kind of extreme antagonism. But interestingly, uh, synergy seems to be dominating emergent interaction, and there wasn't a pattern between them. So in summary, uh, original methods seem to have difficulty identifying antagonisms, um, and antagonism seems to be dominating these net interactions, while synergy dominates emergent interactions. We also found a lot of examples of hidden suppression in 74% of combinations. That's when the presence of a third stressor uh, suppresses a two-way interaction. Um, and we didn't find a relationship between the net interaction type and the emergent interaction type. So this is quite important. As mentioned, biological systems are very complex. Um, and Mary's talk also talked about the importance of interactions, the fact that they exist. So stressor uh, interact, um, stressors interact and form these population responses. So we need to understand how they're interacting to, um, to better manage our population. So maybe if we are mitigating one stressor that might actually be um, in an interaction, we might end up with a more negative impact than we expected. So it's important to parse these apart with methods that identify them. So um, this is ecology and evolutionary biology. We know that, that that's not the end of the story with fitness. Um, so evolution and plasticity is a thing. Um, and so we explored how populations respond to um, stress or interactions in an urban setting um, with the dark-eyed juncos. Um, just to orient ourselves. So here we are. Um, so I'm going to talk about juncos across cities and uh, these things that are happening within the population itself. The first thing that I was interested in doing is looking at um, juncos across cities, seeing if their morphologies converge or diverge across cities. Um, and this is really important to me, at least. Um, so urbanization is a really um, big thing. So we are urbanizing as a global population. It's the number one, number two threat to um, biodiversity loss. And this is because uh, urbanization presents a strong mismatch between the evolutionary history of organisms um, and this novel environment that, that we have built um, around us. And that doesn't leave a lot of time for them to catch up in an evolutionary sense. Uh, this results in strong selective pressures, which causes this biodiversity loss, um, as well as in some cases kind of debated this idea of biological homogenization, where some species seem to do well repeatedly across cities. Um, the species that do well we call urban adapters, and they evolve pretty readily to urban um, areas, so they have strong evolutionary change often. Um, and that allows us uh, an opportunity to study evolution in the wild. And um, one thing that I'm particularly interested in is seeing how successful urban colonization happens. So what's going on with birds? Um, the Tingley Lab did a really cool piece <laughs> recently um, about what makes an urban bird. Across species, there are some patterns that seem to be um, prevalent in the literature. 
um, and in this really cool analysis you should read. Um, so urban birds typically seem to have smaller body sizes, seem to be more generalist, so they eat like a lot of different things rather than just one or two things. Um, they seem to have higher reproductive output, seem to be um, more dispersing. Uh, and there are also patterns within species that seem a little bit less consistent. So species seem to um, sometimes shift in their morphology. They might have shorter wings and tails, which I'll talk about in a bit. Um, there have been noted differences in bill size and shape, but patterns seem to be inconsistent and vary by species and geography. Um, one issue with a lot of that species level analysis is that most of the studies done have centered on a single city and non-urban pair. Um, that's recently been changing, but the literature is just starting to catch up. So we asked if one species undergoes similar adaptation across different urban replicate populations. So do different cities um, seem to end up with similar looking birds? Uh, we worked on the dark-eyed junco, our little LA star <laughs> here, um, across different cities in um, Southern California. Um, while we have data across Los Angeles, this study is restricted to the different UCs because they have similar um, colleges, uh, UCSB in Santa Barbara, UCLA in LA, um, UCSD in San Diego, as well as a few different um, forested mountain sites. So juncos are really cool um, for many reasons, I will explain. Um, but they're a really cool model because historically, they've really mainly bred in um, mountain non-urban regions. And while they're migratory and might come down um, lower elevation, in the past 50 or so years, they seem to have shut off their migration, settled and expanded um, across different cities in Southern California. Um, so we view them probably as isolated populations, uh, which we are testing um, with genetics, which I'm not gonna show you because that's still processing. Um, but that makes them a really cool study uh, to, a really cool study system to test these questions. The San Diego population has been heavily studied by Pam for her PhD. So uh, some parallelism there, which is really cool. Um, and uh, that population differs from local mountains in a few different ways. So their song changes, which makes sense, a lot of noise. Um, they have different reproductive behavior. So an extended breeding season, um, they're less fearful from humans. Um, there is less male aggression, more parental care. Um, and there's also shifts in these um, morphological traits. So they have like a smaller tail white patch, shorter wings and tails. Um, so cool. Um, but the rest of the populations haven't been well studied. So we asked a few questions across these different cities. Um, first, we asked if bill size and shape differs across cities. Um, and we expected um, increased surface area of bills with higher temperature, regardless of urbanization. Cities normally have um, this urban heat island effect. So within really densely urban areas, it's hotter. Um, but LA varies or Southern California varies in temperature, which I'll talk about. We also expected um, potential shape variation associated with urbanization. Um, because the resources are different typically in cities um, and maybe they're using anthropogenic, like human trash and stuff eating. You see jumpers and trash cans, it's, uh, it's a thing. Um, we also asked if wing shape and body size differs. So we expected um, higher wing loading um, in the built environment. Um, so like shorter wings, heavier birds, they're more agile um, and potentially smaller bodies going with the, the trend of smaller body birds in, uh, in urban areas. How did we do this? We caught like a ton of juncos. Um, we misnetted and banded individuals, each had individual color bands. Um, and in urban areas and neighboring mountain populations, we measured them, we sampled blood um, and other things, and then we released them, we tracked them for behavioral testing and observation, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Um, and then, uh, so this was our total sample sizes across these sites. Uh, that's how we weigh birds, people find it funny. Um, and we also extracted built up index. So like how much built up cover is there um, in a 50 meter radius from each bird's capture site um, and the average maximum monthly temperature um, as well for over the past 20 years. Uh, so first just to cat, uh, characterize these sites. So non-urban areas had lower built cover than all the different urban areas that we looked at. Um, it's important to mention that arid areas, it's harder to properly categorized because bare soil sometimes comes up as built cover. So there's some variation there. 
Um, and we also looked at um, maximum monthly temperature. So there was a lot of variation in non-urban sites, uh, but UCLA was hotter than San Diego, which was hotter than Santa Barbara, which is important to keep in mind because um, I'm gonna explain how things were confusing. Um, so uh, juncos seem to have interesting patterns of morphological variation. Um, so if you're seeing things in like orangish red, that means it's a trait that differed. Um, so juncos um, differed in their bill shape and size at UCLA um, and UCSB, but not UCSD. So UCSD juncos didn't seem to diverge um, to, uh, in comparison to non-urban juncos. And um, we found that bill surface area was associated with temperature positively, um, but that there was also an association um, with cities, uh, so there, that was an important variable, but in a, in a way that didn't really match the expectation. So warmer cities, LA, had smaller bill surface area than non-urban um, non birds. Um, so that might be due to their shifting bill shape despite the temperature. Here is data. Um, so non-urban or UCLA birds had shorter bills um, and less bill surface area than non-urban birds. Um, and the bill length to depth ratio, so like how stubby their bill is, uh, differed as well. And that's something that might relate to foraging. So UCLA and UCSB birds seem to differ from non-urban birds. With wing um, loading, that was not relevant to any of our variables. Uh, so wing loading didn't seem to vary with built cover with cities. But wing length, um, which we can use as a measure of, of body length when wing loading doesn't really um, matter, uh, did vary by built cover. So with higher built cover, birds were smaller. Um, and here in blue are males, um, red are females. We had fewer females in non-urban sites, uh, just to keep in mind. <clears throat> okay, so in conclusion, we found that some traits seem to um, diverge and some have consistent patterns with urbanization. Why do bills differ across the cities? That was what kept me up at night. Um, for the past year. So um, we, we thought about a few different things. Maybe it's not effect. So maybe the birds that came to the cities had different bills. Um, and that doesn't seem to be supported um, because we see dispersal um, from some banded birds to, to, to and from UCLA specifically. So we had a bird that was banded by somebody else in the Santa Susanas, which is like further north from the Santa Monica's um, at UCLA, which was pretty cool. Um, we also had a bird sighted um, by a community member that was banded as a nestling, and, but was found in um, like Griffith Park, like in a green chunk of Griffith Park, which is very big and very far. So we know that there's at least some gene flow. Um, we thought about song. Um, so sometimes song can select on bill features. That doesn't seem to be supported. So we expect higher frequency song in urban areas, which are associated um, with shorter bills. Um, but um, LA juncos didn't shift their song. Uh, so we did a different study on that, um, but uh, San Diego juncos did. So the patterns yet again, do not match. Um, we thought about bird seed. So sometimes in urban areas, people give bird seeds that has led to evolution in other species, but that typically leads to longer bills, not shorter bills. Um, so our working hypothesis is that maybe it has to do with other stuff. So maybe the juncos here in Santa Barbara might be um, expanding their niche to use other kinds of foods, maybe trash, something like that. Um, or maybe um, they're eating in areas that are more cemented and they're kind of plastically shifting their bill shape. Um, so there might be some sort of behavioral component and maybe San Diego juncos didn't do that yet. Will um, do it eventually, maybe not. Junkos are interesting, but uh, Sarah uh, Freemuth in our lab is looking at more fine scale landscape um, determinants of this variation, which is cool. So stay tuned. Okay, so next we looked at plasticity in two different ways um, with human disturbance. So plasticity, for those that don't know, is basically like how behavior, here I'm talking about behavioral plasticity. So how behavior might differ with the environment changing. Um, some sort of environmental variable. Um, so I looked at humans with COVID-19 restrictions. So um, the first chapter I'm gonna be talking about is urban birds become less fearful following COVID-19 reopenings, uh, which was in collaboration with Ian McGregor Forrest and Dan Blumstein, and is obviously Pam uh, who's involved with all of this. Um, okay, so why should we care about fear? 
while we do see a lot of patterns, different kinds of patterns with a lot of traits in urban settings, fear seems to be one um, that has more universal uh, patterns. So tolerating humans is essential for living in the city. We are everywhere. If you're afraid of humans, you're going to have a hard time um, existing. So urban adapters have a decrease in fear response in comparison to non-urban um, relatives. Uh, but the processes underlying this difference is challenging to test. So it could be maybe um, plastic. So they might adjust to human presence over the course of their lifespan. It could be non-plastic. So maybe um, birds that have lower fear response are the ones that um, enter into the city. Uh, they occupy this area because they can. It might be a combination. So maybe plasticity itself is under selection. Um, so it's hard to parse apart because it's hard to remove humans from the landscape until um, there was a global pandemic um, and the lockdowns left everybody at home. Um, so the COVID-19 lockdowns have been turned the anthropause uh, because humans kind of paused from uh, the environment. And we were able to test how human presence affects fear response in urban birds. We measure fear response by uh, flight initiation distance. So we approach a bird, see how far we are from the bird when it flies away. And that is our um, fear response measure, FID. So shorter FID um, is less fearful. Um, longer FID is more fearful from humans. Uh, what do we know about fear response? Um, so the San Diego population has a lower fear response um, and this seems to be associated with different stress physiology and other behavior. So maybe it has some sort of non-plastic underpinnings. Um, the LA population has a lower fear response. Um, work uh, has demonstrated habituation to novel vehicles. So like if you approach a Junko with the sound of a scooter, um, its fear response is a bit different than the sound of foot, uh, footsteps. So there is some um, plasticity there that's pretty rapid. Scooters are newish. Um, so it suggests that maybe both of these are at play. Um, we looked specifically at UCLA long-term after um, understanding fear response across cities, which I'll talk about um, soon. So at UCLA, we asked if dark-eyed juncos respond to shifts in human activity at the population level, the individual level, um, and then we um, were able to get at early life effects of it as well. <clears throat> so at UCLA, we banded birds in 2016 ongoing, um, and I began doing FIDs in 2018. UCLA closed on March 14th, 2020. That date is important because our first nest that was scheduled to hatch was scheduled to hatch the following week. So chicks that hatched um, in spring 2020 hatched during the anthropause um, and campus stayed closed until fall 2021. Um, so there were two breeding seasons um, in the anthropause, uh, which is super cool because I got to do this like accidental full factorial natural experiment. Um, <laughs> Uh, so that was really fun. We can, um, we can age birds in the hand with molt limits. Um, so their feather patterns are a little bit different than um, older birds. So if we saw a second year bird um, in 2019, assayed it, I did a fear response thing, um, then we know that it lived its whole life with high human activity, probably. In 2020, a second year bird um, that was assayed was assayed with low human activity or no human activity, um, but had lived its life up to that point with high human activity. In 2021, all second year birds had never experienced a really busy city um, or UCLA campus. Um, in 2022, the birds that we assayed had high human activity around, but likely hatched with low human activity. <clears throat> um, so Similar to our expectations across these different cities, there is low flight initiation distance. Um, this is log transform, just so you know, because it's easier to see in our models, it's gamma distributed. Um, we found similar shifts in fear response across cities. And over COVID, we expected birds to return to that um, non-urban baseline. Um, so we expected them to resensitize to humans um, and then potentially um, desensitize after um, reopenings or we expected them to not change at all. Maybe they habituate and they stay at that new level, um, or maybe going back to those non-plastic um, mechanisms, maybe they're just occupying areas based on um, pre-existing fear response. Um, we didn't 
uh, find either of those things. I, it was really weird. <laughs> um, so Junko stayed the same more or less um, <clears throat> before the pandemic all through the anthropos. And then when it reopened, uh, all of a sudden they were not afraid of me very much. Uh, so that was really interesting. Um, and this seems to be supported um, when we include a whole ton of factors. We accounted for habituation, we accounted for season, timing in the day. Um, yeah, it was it was interesting um, and uh, it didn't match our predictions. This seemed to hold true at the individual level. So here we ran another model just including the birds we had data for across all three time points before, during, and after the anthropause, which is marked in red. And nearly universally, they lowered their fear response that was held up in models accounting for habituating to me. Um, on the right, just to visualize this a little bit more too, those are um, the mean for each bird before the anthropause, during and after subsetted, just uh, birds that we had at least two time points for. Some birds didn't make it to 2022. Um, <laughs> and you're looking at the um, mean um, before to during and then during to after. So there seems to be this consistent drop. Um, so yet again, held up statistically. <clears throat> With early life effects, um, we saw a similar pattern. Basically in 2022, birds, um, second year birds also had a lower fear response. So there was something about that absence of human presence and then um, all of a sudden a lot of humans that affected their fear response. Um, so the 2022 birds were different basically, um, whether either way you look at it. This is a fledgling and it's cute. Um, okay, so interesting. Um, they didn't adjust their fear response during the anthropause, but then it lowered consistently. Um, and that was consistent with individuals only exposed to humans as adults. So that led us to propose a couple new hypotheses. One is that maybe fear response acts as a ratchet. Each burst of human activity lowers fear response in urban, um, in urban juncos, and maybe it stays at that baseline. Um, another possibility is that maybe it acts as a spring. So each burst of human activity lowers the fear response, and then maybe over time they'll resensitize to a given urban baseline, which we are currently testing um, this year. <clears throat> so the take home is that there is variation in fear response and plasticity, but not in the way we expect. And COVID allowed us to uncover some unexpected mechanisms. So um, I also looked at um, nesting behavior um, during the anthropause, this was in collaboration with Sam, who is here in a follow-up to his master's thesis, looking just at novel nesting behavior um, in LA in comparison to San Diego um, and plasticity. I'm running out of time, so I'm gonna be, I'll try. Um, okay, so San Diego juncos nest above ground in novel sites, work that Pam did um, during her PhD. And this seems to be adaptive um, there. So above ground nests were more successful than on ground nests. Um, and we saw similar patterns at UCLA, um, which I'll talk about in a second. But first, um, this is a San Diego nest that was interesting. She found in a helmet on a bike. They get very creative and they get very creative here too. So Sam's work showed that they do informed renesting, so adaptive plasticity. They're more likely to stay on the same substrate if it was successful, more likely to change if it was a failure. Um, so that's cool. It's plastic. Um, in LA, they seem to nest above ground more often um, than in San Diego. And we were wondering why. So is this driven by human disturbance? Maybe they're avoiding people. Maybe they're like UCLA is more dense and it's closer to people on the ground. Um, or is it because of the landscape or maybe urban predators, um, things unrelated to human disturbance. So we tracked nesting patterns in 2019 and 2021 and compared them. Um, and here you can see some of our fun findings. So here is a nest in a helmet. Um, we also found a helmet nest um, leaning on a saw in an underground parking lot in a break room um, from the maintenance crew. So they found this nest. They're like, there's a bird nesting in our helmet. Um, and um, it did fail, but it was really cool. Um, here is a nest in an outdoor stairwell used by humans on Broad. Um, the birds at Broad love stairs. On the right is another stairway nest accessible outside. The stairway is inside, but has like slats. Um, this was uh, somebody like sweeped the lamp. We were very sad, but we managed to rescue all the chicks and put the nest back together and it succeeded. It was thrown out the data set, um, but it was wonderful. Um, this is a nest in the alumni center and like the overhang 14 feet high within the grates. Um, you'll see me on a ladder here, a uh, different nest, but it was a fun time. 
Um, so we tracked reproduction during, um, including um, nesting substrates in 2019, 2021. We also looked at success. Um, so we treated a nest as successful if it fledged at least one chick um, and tested the proportion of on ground versus above ground nests or artificial versus non artificial nesting substrates between years. Um, we've been noticed by campus undergrads. Um, so we've been described as um, looking like crazy, uh, straight up crazy people a lot of the time, but they're doing it for their research and seem not to care what people think, which takes guts. Um, always love it when people don't care what other people think. So uh, we're quirky, but it's okay. <laughs> um, we see similar rates of artificial and off-ground nesting across these time points. Um, so it seems to be driven not by human disturbance. We also saw a slight increase in nest success during uh, the pandemic, but that was within the range we expected by year-to-year -year stochasticity based on PAM's work. Um, so in some, they exhibit adaptive nesting plasticity and it seems to be convergent across cities. Um, this seems to be driven by landscape effects or potentially different urban predation pressures, not human disturbance. This is a nest underneath a strewn cardboard box in a gutter by Haynes that succeeded. So interesting. Um, it's cool. Okay, so big picture, what did I find across all these things? Um, stressor response is complex and really challenging to predict from the small to large scale, but it's important to understand the context and think about integrative approaches um, going from the mechanism to the observed pattern. Also, juncos are weird. Um, so that's what I've been up to the past six years um, and just some loose ends, other adventures. One of my goals was to sow the seeds or bands for a long-term Junko research site. And I'm very excited to say that so far it's been quite successful and it's gonna continue after I leave. So we've also looked at aggression, which you see here um, during COVID, work done by Mars Walters, um, who's graduated. We've looked at Song. Um, this is a former undergrad, Maggie Fang. Um, Maggie Fang and uh, Felicia Wong um, published this work for her master's thesis. Um, we are looking at feather stuff um, in a few different ways. Uh, so feather color patterns, um, we're looking at genomics. We'll try to understand the population genetics and evolutionary history of the population. Wilmer's looking at parasites, immunology, um, microbiota, um, and follower undergrads on TikTok. A lot of junkos, very fun. Uh, bunch of junkos. Um, I've also had the privilege of working on transdisciplinary um, engagement and just really fun stuff. So Wilmer and I have uh, been working with Heart of Los Angeles um, and we teach them um, urban birds and we go around the neighborhood and bird and they love it and we love it. So this was our second year doing that and that'll hopefully continue next year. I've also worked with Counterforce and Yoga and is here from DMA. Um, so it's a lab in DMA where I've been associate director there. And we have um, thought about urban ecology and birds in relation to environmental justice and community storytelling um, and trying to build for those intersections. So this is a prototype of a structure we've designed called the Biophilia Treehouse. Um, and that's led by Rebecca Mendez. I've had the privilege of also working with Rebecca Mendez on um, her artistic response to um, pollution and DDT contamination off the coast and understanding the implications of that um, and how do we respond to that um, history. So this is an immersive art piece of hers called The Sea Around Us. Um, and that's been really cool because it's tied with all these different aspects of my dissertation over the year and finding different ways of engaging with and communicating um, that science um, and what it might mean for society. So with that, I've been busy, but it's been fun. Um, and I wanted to um, thank all the Junkos. Um, I come from a film family. I'm like the black sheep. So this is a way of <laughs> sharing. <laughs> we name all of our birds. Uh, it's really creative. Um, the undergrads love it. It's another way of seeing our personality and the birds themselves. Um, as well as cultural moments over the past six years, you might notice that the uh, Game of Thrones characters stopped uh, <laughs> <laughs> rapidly. So thank you all so much and everybody that's helped and I'm out of time, but thank you. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> I don't know. If, yeah, Tom. So uh, wonderful presentation. Um, 
I, of course, as a committee member, I'm a little disappointed that I didn't get a junk donate, but. Uh, no, we named his name. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We actually named uh, one right outside where your office was oh, no, that you did a cloacal swab on. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so, yeah. So, actually, I do have a question. Uh, the, the, um, the reduction in sexual dimorphism mm. is pretty interesting. It could be you know, sexual selection. It could be trophic differentiation. That's reduced. What do you what do you think is going on with the San Diego Junkos? And well, yeah, 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 with the, yeah, um, from urban to wild. So with the San Diego Junkos, there is a chance it could be their founder population, which has recently been identified in one of the few areas understudied for Junkos. But we did see um, preliminarily and not published and not in my thesis, sorry. But um, we did see that that's repeated in LA. So there seems to be something going on specifically with that trait. I think that it probably has to do, um, they have a very long reproductive season in, um, in urban areas. It's doubled in comparison to non-urban areas. So I think that it might be selection on parental care versus aggression. And they're just being maybe slightly less territoriality. They're, they're less aggressive in urban areas. So I think it's probably associated with a consortium of traits. Probably nothing to do with our so I don't know. <laughs> um, we do see them flick their their tail when they're looking for um, food sometimes. So for insects, um, but it could be it could be associated with them eating different things. Um, but we don't know. It's hard to test that because it takes a lot of observation. Um, yeah. But if you want to open junko guts, let me. Yeah. Okay. Great. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, so it's like literally running on the cluster. Um, it's been running on the cluster. So we've uh, we've sequenced 200 juncos um, and um, I'm new to bioinformatics. So uh, the genomes are currently um, being assembled. We're like 90 genomes in. So please ask me in like three weeks um, if that's okay. It's one of the, the projects that undergrads are being involved with in this summer, um, understanding the population structure and, and the phylogeny of the different um, populations. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, my first question was um, the uh, bill, the difference in bill length between uh, populations. Do you think that has a genetic basis or could that be environmental like due to wear and tear from poor you know, pavement? And then is that something that could be examined in the common garden? Um, yeah, that's a good question. So it could be, um, it could be plasticity. It could be genetic. Um, I think, um, I'm trying to remember if we saw a statistical difference in the depths and the width themselves, because um, I think you'd expect like wearing of the tip. Um, and I honestly can't remember because I spent so long putting this together. But I think that I think it might be a combination. So if they're eating trash, which is my guess, um, maybe they are eating that on pavement um, and that's wearing it down. Um, but that's also something like bill, bill shape um, has a lot of genetic underpinnings. So that's something that I'm really hoping to get to genetically because we don't have an aviary here to do common gardens. And I know Pam knows how really challenging it is to hand rear juncos, um, but I hope to also have an answer for you once the genetics come through this summer. Yeah. Uh, dimorphism in bill size and were you catching different ratios, sex, sex ratios? Uh, mm. between the different cities and could that affect your overall results? Yeah, we did account for sex in our study, in our um, models. Um, Bill specifically did not have an association with sex. Um, so I don't think that that would explain it. Yeah. Uh, great talk, Emily. Thank you. Um, I think it's so cool that you used the thing as part of your research. And I was wondering, what about that response, um, do the more, so the juncos in more natural areas become more predators? Um, and like here, maybe they just stab and stab and go, go here. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. Um, predation itself, I'm not sure. I know, like in comparison, let's see, I know that the juncos are predated here. 
because we've seen that unfortunately by hawks yeah and then also as chicks um but hawks are growingly common in la um i don't have the the data year to year but i know that they've been increasing um so it kind of still runs oppositional um but it might be part of it so that's something that's that's thought to happen also urban areas is these like areas of predation release so maybe they can adapt to human presence and um, they don't have to worry as much um, about hawks or maybe they're viewing humans as different um, from um, other kinds of predators. A lot of the predation in cities, um, and I imagine in non-urban areas, happens on the nest specifically. Yeah. That includes of the adults. So that could be cats too. Other questions? Cool, thank you all.